August 1987. Every day was different, and every day was full. I ran my ass off as a production assistant at whatever location I was sent to, then rushed somewhere else, rendezvousing with Darren along the way for that night's act up commitment. And after that, it was out for beers, and after that, we'd crash on whatever couch or bed or floor was available. I slept poorly in strange apartments, but I thrilled at seeing how these New Yorkers lived, the way they furnished their spaces, the images they hung on their walls, the books that lined their shelves. I said yes to any book that anyone held out to me, critical theory, queer novels, monographs from artists new to me but apparently essential. Stuffing these into my backpack with the extra clothes and toiletries that I carried around, Paul Mitchell hair gel, Colgate toothpaste, men speed stick. One night I called Elliot to let him know I'd miss a coordinating committee meeting because a production shoot was running into overtime. People are dying, he said, and you're going to work? Beneath his usual irony, I sensed a real pressure and urgency. Every one of us felt we could always do more. One Saturday, the outreach committee met at Dojo's, the cheap Japanese place near NYU, writing the text for a palm card to be handed out at the March on Washington that fall. It was a business card, really, though ACT UP would never use the word business. The meeting was overseen by Rochelle, a professor with decades of activist cred, feminist, labor, queer, whose long, frizzy hair and crooked overbite made her seem less intimidating, like your favorite aunt instead of someone who would outsmart you in the next argument. Amanda and Jonathan were on the committee, too, and the three of us, the youngest in the group, gravitated toward each other. We haggled over every word. We started with a phrase from a previous fact sheet. By 1991, more people will die from AIDS each year than were lost in the entire Vietnam War. It should say more Americans, Rochelle pointed out. That statistic doesn't include Vietnamese deaths. Then there was the debate over the word genocide. The government's failure on AIDS absolutely seemed deliberate, a plan, but genocide pushed buttons, especially for Jonathan and Rochelle, both Jewish and averse to the Holocaust as metaphor. Still, weren't we already using the pink triangle on our t-shirts? In the end, we phrased it as a question on the palm card. What is the government's real policy on AIDS? Is this genocide? We would keep arguing about language. Meanwhile, we had to provoke people to join us. The meeting at Dojo's broke up, and Jonathan, camcorder in hand, asked if Amanda and I wanted to come along to Tompkins Square Park for some kind of neighborhood fair, where he hoped to interview a straight couple he had recently met. He called them recovering IV drug users passing out information about clean works. I knew nothing about IV drug use. I'd never been to Tompkins Square. I'd never even walked east of First Avenue into Alphabet City, the grittiest, crackiest part of downtown. But I said yes. Of course I said yes. The sky was gray that day, a silvery blanket with a sharp ozone sting. And the gray sidewalks were covered in even darker splotches, chewing gum spit out and flattened into blobs that looked to me like lesions. On St. Mark's Place, buildings of limestone and brick with ornate scrollwork along their cornices suggested some lost, more profitable age. Large windows glared behind iron bars, warding off thieves. Soot framed everything, a fine powder outlining the architecture, and fire escapes rippled with rust. Even though we'd just eaten rice and vegetables, we stopped at the corner of First Ave because Jonathan said, I had to try Stromboli's pizza. How long have you lived here? Amanda asked him. I think she, like me, was a little starry-eyed. He said he'd come to the city three years earlier, a punk escaping Long Island. While I'd been ensconced in college, he picked his way through odd jobs and rotating apartments with too many roommates and not enough furniture. Amanda said that she was looking for somewhere to live. Her nomadic father was reclaiming his tiny rent-controlled apartment where she had been staying that summer with one of her college girlfriends, Josie, and now Josie was moving in with her new girlfriend. She hasn't been my lover for years, Amanda said, but now that she found someone else, 
I want her all over again. I need to get out of my situation too, Jonathan said. He'd been staying in a storefront on 13th Street off A with an older artist. They'd blacked out the windows with paint, but street noise churned just beyond the muddy glass. And now Pierre is dealing coke and speed, which means too much temptation, Jonathan confessed. I don't know even if he's my lover. It's undefined. Through stringy bites of pizza cheese, I told them Darren and I were looking too. Jonathan seemed surprised. I assumed you'd already moved out from your parents. I know, it's embarrassing. No, I just, you don't seem like someone living in the suburbs. Yes, I enthused, and he smiled along with me. Amanda said, let's find somewhere big enough for all of us to live. It would have to be a commercial space, Jonathan said, something cheap we could convert. He'd been helping out at a gallery, installing video art, and he said he'd ask around. I rocketed right into the fantasy of this communal future, the furniture we would drag in from the street, the film editing station where we'd assemble Jonathan's footage, the painted floor on which our friends would sprawl, making banners for the next demonstration. I imagined the graffiti-tagged freight elevator. I was already planning potluck dinners with bottles of scotch and wine and everyone smoking cigarettes. As we neared Tompkins Square with its wrought iron fence and its cracked pavement, I was vibrating with all of it. The weather, the architecture, the biographies of these new friends who were the same age as me, but already storied and worldly. Even the pizza, a tangy, doughy New York slice. I felt the power of walking beyond the limit of where I'd previously ventured, even if that new distance was just a single city block. The three of us wandered past the punks with their studded collars and wire-sharp mohawks, past the homeless encamped on the park's inner green, a labyrinthine village built from tents and tarps and shopping carts. A musty, decidedly human stench mingled with incense, patchouli, Puerto Rican food frying in oil, marijuana rolled into tobacco and smoked in thick blunts by dim-eyed boys in zip-up jackets. I saw the three of us in our black boots and cuffed jeans, our activist buttons pinned to our activist t-shirts, playing our necessary part. We followed Jonathan to a table where a guy with dreads and a woman with hoop earrings and a do-rag around shiny hair were demonstrating how to sterilize works with bleach and handing out pamphlets about a needle exchange pilot program in Amsterdam. While Jonathan recorded, another man stepped up to the table, identified himself as a recovering addict too, and challenged them, saying, the only path is strictly clean and sober. blessings upon us. Later, when Darren asked me about my day, I mentioned the idea of living with Amanda and Jonathan, but he was wary. Shouldn't we look for somewhere just for us? I wanted that too, our love nest at last, but I tried to convey to him my earlier excitement, wrapped up in that intangible feeling of arriving, approaching the park with Amanda and Jonathan and being absorbed into it, and in doing so, taking the next steps toward becoming someone who would earn his place in this vibrant and risky world. <laughs> <laughs> 